We're going to start now on some questions. Uh, some of these are questions that I prepared. Some of these are questions that you all submitted and talk about some of the issues that David just mentioned. And the first, and I think the most pressing, that you mentioned in your remarks is the debt. $16.6 trillion, headed to $20 trillion by the end of the decade. Erskine Bowles, the other part of the Bowles-Simpson duo, former chief of staff to President Clinton, has said we'll pay a trillion dollars a year in interest by the time we get to the end of the decade. Well, I, I should know. You should know as a North Carolinian, we claim Erskine Bowles. You know, he was, he was president of our university, mm -hmm. the University of North Carolina. So we're very proud of Erskine. He, he's a great American. He's also very frustrated. But how, how in the next, you, you're short-term pessimistic. Are we going to be able to address this debt and deficit problem before the interest overtakes us? Well, the, the, the interest, that's a hard question. Um, I, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. Bill Clinton makes the point regularly now that if you look at the, we, we have this large debt we're paying interest on, but interest rates today are very, very low. So the interest payments on the debt are in the $200, $250, $250 billion range, which is high, obviously, but, but very low compared to the size of the debt. But, but President Clinton makes the point, when the economy eventually gets back to about where it was when he was president, the interest rates when he was president are three times what they are today. So that means your interest payment, annual interest payment on the debt triples like that. That is when the rubber really hits the road. Because that means you're you're in tough shape. You can't you you know all these calculations you see leave off that little proposition. They sort of just assume low interest rates mm -hmm. for a long time. You made the argument when you were in the Senate and you had a plan. I think it was back in 2007 or so. Mm -hmm. Basically, you wanted to hold spending, as I understand it, to the, the pre-recession levels, 2007, and you wanted to just if we kept it there, we could get this thing under control, uh, which I think has a I mean, that is a very useful analytical point for where to start. You have to make a lot of tough choices that'll make it work. I don't know whether you allowed for inflation and all this. Sort of I assume you put inflation into the into We the did, but you know, the, the whole idea of capping spending at some point so that you could have some internal discipline to make choices. Yeah, but you, you know, we cannot fool ourselves. The choices that would have to be made are going to be tough, tough choices. We have not made, even with the sequester, which is, you know, people are tra treating it like Chicken Little, before it all happened, you know, the sky was going to fall as soon as the sequester went into place, and clearly we're still here. Um, the, uh, but the sequester is tiny compared to what's really got to be done. It is just, a, it's, a, it's, it's a stupid way to cut because it's random and it's mindless. And, it, and you know, it, it, you, it, and, and there are ways, I mean, saving money by cutting out the White House tours, I'll give me a break. The, uh, uh, at least they're going to have the Easter egg roll. That's good progress. Uh, the, uh, but the fact is, either we're going to have our taxes go way up or continue to go up, or we're going to have to find some way to um, change the entitlement structure. And you can't do it by a little snip here and a little snip there. And, and we're just not ready to face up to that. Uh, or we're going to have to do something about the final year of death or something like that. We're going to have to be, have a different culture uh, about how people are going to die. I, I actually think it would make a lot more sense if we did have more people who sort of could seriously consider, you know, their, what their plans are going to be. And, you know, after you hit a certain age, do you have a plan that's f with your family and with your doctor about what kind of treatment you should get so we don't... We could save some money with the kind of, from this kind of heroic treatments we go through, but it's going to take a very brave politician mm -hmm. to lead us through that. It's going to take a very, very brave leader to, to, to have the kind of conversations we ultimately are going to have to have. You came to Washington in a time when, as you said, we had the World War II generation. They were folks who would roll up their sleeves, and even though they had differences, they would get things done. We've lost that in Washington for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. 24-hour television doesn't help either when there's always an opportunity to bash the other side. Uh, folks having to come home every week uh, to camp, you know, every weekend to go campaign and raise money and not staying in Washington like they used to and spending time with each other's families and getting a real rapport like members of Congress used to have. Put on your, your professorial hat for a second. This system of government that we've had has worked very well and it's been, you know, something we've been extremely proud of since 1787, but does it serve modern America? I, I was reading in your book, Eyewitness to Power, which is a great book 
that you all should read about his experience with four U.S. presidents. You mentioned that Lloyd Cutler, the former uh, general counsel to the president of the United States, at one point was looking for new solutions. Should we amend the Constitution? Are there things that we need to do differently? Is this system of government still well suited for modern America? The system is not failing us. We're failing the system. You know, the, the, this system, this structure, has been incredibly successful. We've got the oldest living constitution. Are there some changes, modest changes, that one might want to make? Yes. But I, I do remember, going back to the Lloyd Cutler point, Lloyd Cutler was a very prominent uh, attorney in Washington, Democrat, who, uh, and a wonderful man, and, but we, we went through presidents, we went through a series of essentially uh, of failures or, or disasters or tragedies with our presidents from, you know, John Kennedy was shot, Lyndon Johnson got forced out of office, you know, uh, uh, Richard Nixon was forced to leave because of scandal, George, uh, Jerry Ford, you know, had the shortest presidency of the 20th century cut short. And then Jimmy Carter came along and was a one-term president. And at the end, toward the end of that, in the late 70s, that's when Lloyd Cutler proposed, let's have something like a parliamentary government. Let's have, let's rewrite the Constitution. Let's have a constitutional convention. And people were, and you remember Carter, you know, gave his famous Malay speech uh, in 1979. And the country was despondent about the future. I uh, thought nobody could govern. And then along came the most improbable person, you know, this cowboy, class B movie actor, <laughs> who within three months after he got to the White House, people said, we finally have a leader in the White House again. And things got a lot better. It was very similar to what happened with FDR. You know, who, who, he, you know he was not given credit. I mean, everybody thought he was going to be a lightweight. Uh, but he came out and he was succeeding Herbert Hoover, who was a highly admired person before he was president. Uh, and it turned out FDR, within days they were saying we finally have a leader in the White House. Leadership matters. The individuals matter. And it's, if we have to produce the leaders who can, who in fact can make the structure work, from my point of view, that's what, we're, what we ought to be doing with our young people. Because it's not just about trying to get individuals, it's also about trying to create a culture that we once had, to try to bring back some of the cultural attributes that people felt, and what I think is in this younger generation, is there is a culture about we're in this together. This is not about whether you, if you win, I lose, which is what the kind of politics we're seeing in Washington now. It's about we all win together. You know, it's what President Clinton kept arguing, we cannot let diversity be our enemy, it's got to be our friend. And we have to be sort of realize we're part of one family uh, in order to make this work. And when you get into that kind of culture, you find that people, right from the beginning, going all the way back to 1789, and in the writing of the Constitution before that, the Constitution was a series of compromises. They worked carefully together. One of the most important, you know, we had government at, by, at dagger point for a while with, with Hamilton, and Madison and Jefferson are having big, big arguments. And when, when Hamilton, early on in the Washington administration, wanted to have the national government assume all the debts, and the southern states, which had mostly paid the debts, didn't want to do that, because they didn't want to be responsible for the debts of New York or Massachusetts, because they already paid their debts. They'd lived frugally, and why should we have to pay for these other guys? And so they opposed Hamilton on it. And Jefferson had Hamilton and Madison come to dinner in Philadelphia. And that's when they made their grand bargain in one dinner. And what they agreed was, we will assume the debts as long as you move the capital to the south. That's how we got the capital in Washington, D.C. It was a result of a compromise. That's the way people do this. I, 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 one of the last conversations I had with Richard Nixon was just shortly before he died, a couple of weeks before he died. We got off into a... And uh, we, we had sort of a telephone relationship at that time. And we got off to sort of his, as he looked back upon his life. And he said one of the proudest moments in his life came when he was a freshman member of the House of Representatives. He came home from the war, took his uniform off, ran, as you'll recall, the, in 1946, Truman was president. The war was just over. Truman was president, Democrat. And that's when the Republicans won the House and the Senate. It was a big landslide for the Republicans. And that swept in Richard Nixon. 
The next year, the first year Nixon was in office and Harry Truman was still president, Truman realized that Europe was about to go down the drain economically and he really worried that if Europe went down the drain, it would turn communist. And that's when he had his Secretary of State, George Marshall, go to Harvard to present the Harvard plan, the Marshall Plan at the Harvard commencement of 1947. Now here was Nixon's story. When the, when the Marshall Plan was proposed, it was very unpopular. It only had about 17% support in the first Marshall, in the first Gallup poll, because Americans already spent a lot of blood and treasure trying to save Europe. Who wanted to do more? And, and it, so it was a big lift. But Truman then reached out to Republicans, starting with Vandenberg in the Senate, brought them into the White House to write the Marshall Plan. Vandenberg every week would come down to uh, Blair House and they would have lunch together and write the Marshall Plan. They got the Republicans in right from the beginning to be co-authors of the Marshall Plan and to start building up a bipartisan bipartisan support for it. Gradually they got public opinion turned around and Nixon said one of the proudest moments of his life came when the Marshall Plan, a Democratic proposal, was put to a vote in the Republican House of Representatives and he stood up on one side of the aisle to vote in favor of the president's plan and there on the other side of the aisle standing up was another freshman member of the House, John F. Kennedy. And Nixon's point was when the chips are down we stand up together. And that's the spirit we have to, we, it's a question of spirit, not constitution, that I think we have to come to grips with. Great answer, thank you.